Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to this uh, conference. And uh, I think I'm the first person that are going to talk in this uh, panel. And I'm a professor at the University of California lecturer in Perspective for Sustainable Rural Development. And I'm also a co-director of CELIA, that is the Latin American um, Center for Research on Agroecology. And I want to share my presentation very quickly. And today I wanted to talk about agroecology and the transformation in industrial agriculture. And I think it's very important that uh, we realize that industrial agriculture and, and its associated agrochemical, genetic, and mechanized technology have become a major force modifying the biosphere. 80% of the billion hectares of global arable land are in this monoculture that have a lot of problems. What are the, the problems with this industrial food system? First of all, a triple burden of malnutrition. I think with the presentation of Juan and David in the previous panel, we understand that this is the inequality and the poverty is one of the causes of this hunger and also micronutrient deficiencies and obesity and all these problems associated with health. Uh, the ne negative impact on, on human health with pesticide poisoning, antibiotic resistant, uh, nitrate in drinking water, but also environmentally unsustainable because we are losing a lot of biodiversity, we are polluting the water, soil degradation, uh, greenhouse emission, unsustainable use of natural resources, and low resiliency. But the social inequalities, I think, are associated with the uh, other all the aspects that I mentioned before, poverty and disempowerment. And also it's very important to emphasize the neglect of cultural values and traditional knowledge because this statement of small farmers, many industries are moving to the south, many agribusinesses are moving to the global south with via land grabbing. And I take in the advantage of cheap labor and cheap land. And but the most important thing is displacing small farmers from the uh, and also causing a lot of deforestation and ecosystem destruction, undermine the local production and the food security. And I think it's, it's also very important to have this in discussion that we can know um, greening the green revolution because it doesn't work. Masking the problem of industrial agriculture um, and um, unconcealing its symptoms and impacts. Uh, we can know only simplify the efforts to reduce the impacts of industrial agriculture, doing the same but, but under but other num, names like climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification, and so on. And many reports like ISTD have been uh, emphasizing on that. And there is a lot of evidence of, in favor of agroecology, um, numbers of reports that suggest that uh, agroecology has significant potential on social and environment, environmental um, gains from transition from agri uh, transitioning towards agroecological agriculture uh, as a way to, to uh, achieve the sustainability that we wanted to, to have. And what are the goals of, of agroecology? Uh, first of all, we need to say that agroecology is a transformative science that proposes a technical but also a political strategy to change the industrial food model. Uh, we emphasize a radical transformation, the way how we produce the food, but also how we consume the food, by contributing to the local well-being, social justice, and the creation of equitable and health food system. And the other thing that is very important for us, the people that work on agroecology, is link our research or the way are we working with agroecology and with the uh, peasant struggle. Agroecology is a key pillar of the construction of food sovereignty. And I think Peter is going to elaborate more on this. Uh, but it's very important to transform. It means uh, we need to uh, bring autonomy to the small farmers, autonomy from the external inputs, elimination of debt, greater control of markets, and so on. So what are the contribution of agroecology? Uh, we, we also need to talk about the, 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 the agroecology as, as the only way to reconstruct the post-COVID agriculture. It can, it can be the foundation of the new food system 
by uh, extending the action on five main areas. I'm not going to into these five areas, but I wanted to mention some of them. But the, uh, we think that it, 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 agroecology will help to overcome the pesticide treadmill, enriching nature matrix, revitalizing small farms, alternative animal production system, and enhancing urban agriculture. So if you see this graph, I wanted to emphasize the revitalization of the small farms, but also um, all these uh, three pillars, alternative animal production system and optimization of urban agriculture and rural agriculture are going to achieve local food sovereignty, better livelihoods and greater socio-ecological resiliency. At the end, we are going to have these two main objectives that is environmental and human health. And how we can transcend the, the pesticide treadmill uh, using the agroecological principles, we have 2.3 billion kilograms of pesticides that are applied annually worldwide, and many of them are immunosuppressive. But anyway, it's very important now in times of, of the pandemic to think about that many people that are very vulnerable are people that are using these pesticides. So we can use the principles to do this transition using diversification as the main strategy, overcoming the pesticide treadmill, it, requ it requires to replace the monoculture with complex agricultural system that, uh, for example, it will benefit um, um, insects that are going to control the pests, but also it gives farmers greater autonomy as they don't depend on expensive inputs to control pests, but uh, they rely on ecological processes that, that um, are unleash on their biodiverse farms. And the other thing that is very important is revitalization of pest and agriculture. Many evidence shows that agroecology restored the production capacity of the small farms, uh, um, uh, farm scale farms, and agroecological practice improved traditional agriculture yield, increasing the total output of the farm. And uh, at the same time, they conserve agrobiodiversity and they bring many other benefits associated with the food security and environmental integrity. And another aspect that is very important is the uh, nature, uh, the, the matrix, uh, nature matrix where the farms are in bed. When we have um, this kind of uh, very complex matrix, uh, agroecology can flourish very easily. Otherwise, we need to rebuild these territories with the uh, with the agroecological approach using a restoration uh, ecology and at the same time applying the agroecological principles. But one aspect that is very important once we have the technical aspect applying the principle is to understand that we need to transform the corporate food system. We require major shifts from society embed on the market economy to a greater reliance on alternative food networks. We, ne we need to reduce the distance between producer and consumer while we ensure that the food is healthy and accessible to all people. We need to democratize the food system. And also we can create more jobs and create more and retain the, the, uh, the wealth in the local economies. So for that reason, I think we need to move from the food empires that run the block are talking about into more autonomous territories. And for that, we are going to pass from the market-based economy to a solid solidarity economy. And for that, we need to, we need actions. And to scale up agroecology, probably we are going to need a, a support policies that are going to support farmer-to-farmer -farmer network, a research and education at different kind of levels. Um, we are going to need, we need um, policies um, an environment that provide that, those policies that are going to help the, the small scale farming systems. And also uh, it's very important to take a specific action to empower women and youth, and youth in the territories and make a, a strategic alliances with the social movements because um, consumers uh, need to act in a solidarity way because eating is just is also an ecological act, but also a political act. And I just wanted to end up my presentation, given that our 
panelists on agroecology and sustainable rural development. Um, and this is a graph from Eric Hall Jimenez, uh, his table that uh, emphasizes in the different um, corporate food regime or the food movement regime. And I think agroecology is well positioned on the food movement regime. Uh, and it could be two different aspects in this food movement regime, uh, the transitional or transformational. And I think in uh, agroecology is very convinced that the, we are in the discourse or the main uh, discourse on food sovereignty. Via Campesina is taking agroecology as a flag of rural development. And also we need a model that democratizes the food system and dismantle the corporate agri-food monopolies and 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 we need a regional based food system sustainable livelihood protection uh, against dumping and overproduction we need to re revitalize uh, small farmers and peasant agriculture and also uh, for the approach that we are taking is a um, human right to food sovereignty uh, locally and source sustainable produce culturally appropriate and democratize the control on uh, on the negotiations. And finally, I think um, it's very important to at least summarize that agroecology is a scientific and transform transformative science that gives the, the elements uh, to achieve the goals of sustainable development and to achieve the sustainable food system because we emphasize the environmentally safe or sustainable agriculture uh, also a good health, culturally appropriate, vibrant local economy and social equity. And with this, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to the other panelists. Thank you. Hello, I'm Peter Rosset. Uh, I'm a professor in Mexico of agroecology. And uh, I've also recently uh, stepped down from many years as part of the uh, support team of La Via Campesina International. La Via Campesina International is uh, the international movement of farmers, peasants, farm workers. I'm gonna talk about La Via Campesina. La Via Campesina is the world's largest social movement it compo it's composed of organizations of family farmers, of peasant farmers, of indigenous people, of farm workers, of landless peasants in 80 countries around the world. Uh, it's uh, the largest movement of people in the world after the large religions. And it's very important to, to think in terms of, of something like Via Campesina, which is a social movement, because we've heard from all of the speakers here today how many problems we have in the world, how many problems we're facing as humanity, and how large the changes are that we need to make. And so we need to talk about how can we make those changes? Uh, what kind of political force do we actually have as people concerned about our food system? And, uh, and, and what, what kind of measures can we take and who has the political strength to do that? And I would say that only social movements have the ability to make the kind of changes that we need to have in the world today. If we think about the United States, for example, I know not all of our audience is in the United States, but if we think about the United States, the, 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 the biggest positive changes like women getting the vote, like slavery being ended, like the Vietnam War being ended, all became, became about because of mass social movement. Uh, power has money uh, and they do the negative changes and we as people then only have the force of numbers and we have to organize ourselves. So in terms of agroecology, that's not any, any, any different. If I'm a farmer all by myself and with my family and we make an amazing transition to being a model agroecological system on our farm, but we don't belong to any kind of a social movement, there isn't really any way for us to have a multiplier effect and for other farmers to learn from what we're doing, to be inspired from what we're doing and to emulate what we're doing. On the other hand, if we participate in an organization of farmers or peasants or indigenous people that has consciously and actively 
built a process for farmers sharing with farmers and is bringing people to visit our farm because our farm is a model and these other people who are visiting are farmers who are maybe facing problems that we've already solved with agroecological alternative methods and can be inspired by them and can try them out on their own farm, then a multiplier effect is possible uh, to have uh, agroecological changes go from one farm to another, to another, to another. This is the principle that, that's called in, in peasant movements, peasant the peasant or campesino the campesino in Spanish and it's been shown to be the most effective way for a large number of peasant farmers or family farmers to uh, engage in a process by which they are through exchanging with their neighbors, transforming collectively their own reality. And so what Via Campesina as being in 80 countries around the world is able to do is to create exchanges from the local level within a municipality, within a county, to within a region, within a country, to, to at the level, a national level, and then at the international level. And in order to synergize these kind of processes of campesino to campesino, farmer to farmer exchanges, we've created uh, international and national peasant farmer training schools, which are places where farmers teach farmers based on accumulated experience. And also uh, peasant uh, high schools and peasant universities where the sons and daughters of peasants, indigenous people, and other rural populations can go to become experts in small farm agroecology and also to become expert organizers because as I've explained, you have to have an organized social movement process if you want something not to be an isolated example, but you want it to become a very common success story and build the numbers necessary to have overall large scale changes. Not large scale changes by a few large things changing, but large scale changes through many small things changing, many small peasant farms family farms, all together making up territories and in territories making up regions. And the same kind of social movement organizing that is needed to enable us to disseminate agroecology from farmer to farmer uh, through territories, through communities, is also the kind of organizing that's necessary to build political power from peasants, from family farmers, from indigenous people, in order to change some of the, the, the negative policies that, that our bad governments are, are, are implementing that are driving the world and especially rural people to the brink of extinction. Uh, policies like free trade agreements, policies like militarization, policies like subsidies for toxic pesticides, policies like uh, legalization of GMOs, uh, pol pol policies like uh, massive public sector subsidies to transnational corporations, to strip mining companies, policies like not banning uh, toxic chemicals and not banning environmentally destructive activities. In order to change those kind of policies, we have to understand how policy change comes about. Policy change doesn't come about just because we have a better idea. It doesn't come about just because we have scientific studies to support our idea. It comes about through political power. And as I said before, uh, power itself, economic power, corporate power, they have money on their side. They can manipulate people through advertising, through social networks, through many other ways, uh, through buying off politicians. So we, people's movements, we have to use our form of people's power, which is organizing ourselves, organizing our neighbors, organizing movements at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level, and at the international level, like, uh, like La Via Campesina. So, for example, some of the successes in, in rolling back, for example, the attempt of the World Trade Organization to globalize free trade and agriculture was through Via Campesina mobilizing, creating huge street pro protests wherever the WTO uh, tried to meet. And so we've seen that, that this kind of large scale change can take place. It has taken place historically, as I said, giving the examples of the United States, but it requires organization. So. Uh, what I'm here to say, really using the example of La Via Campesina, but it's applicable almost anything, is that if we want change to occur, whether it's the bit by bit change in our communities and our territories uh, through agroecology spreading from farmer to farmer, or whether it's the larger scale change of 
creating enough social protest and enough people's political power to change policies to change governments, it requires social movement organization. I know I sound like a, like a broken record, but it's what's really needed. We can't get large scale change through just a few nonprofits. We've seen clearly that we can't get large scale change just voting at the ballot box. Uh, we can see that we can't get large scale change uh, just by individually, for example, becoming vegetarians, but we can get large scale change through organizing movements. And that's something that history has taught us. And when we talk about transforming the food system, when we talk about agroecology, when we talk about breaking up corporate control over the food system, then automatically we're talking about the need to organize uh, these kind of movements. Now, if, if, we, if we take a look at the situation with COVID and the pandemic, the health contingency around the world, and particularly rural areas where Via Campesina is active, we can see that COVID and the pandemic are like an X-ray of what rural society is like. On the one hand, uh, farmer farming communities, peasant communities, indigenous peoples communities have, have found out how dependent they are on government programs that are that stop serving them as soon as there's any kind of a logistic interruption from the pandemic, are dependent on government health care, which in many countries doctors were with, were withdrawn from rural areas when the when the when the health contingency happened. Uh, farmer farming communities that had given up producing their own food because they were just producing for corporate buyers suddenly found out that the food that they were buying from the food system wasn't arriving in their communities anymore and that they had to get back to planting their own food in addition to whatever they're planting from the market. So on the one hand, the, the pandemic has shown the weakness and dependency of rural communities, but on the other hand, it's shown their hidden strengths. And so we see uh, small farm and peasant and indigenous peoples communities around the world uh, going back to traditional medicine because the healthcare system has abandoned them and actually successfully finding a lot of herbal medicine treatments for the symptoms of COVID. We found communities racing to replant with short-term food crops, uh, short uh, population cycle uh, farm animals, and rapidly recover their own food sovereignty in their communities. We've seen communities start to self-govern themselves because government authorities disappeared during the pandemic. And so it's revealed a rural world that's riddled both with weaknesses, but also with strengths and strengths for people to organize themselves and solve problems in their own communities and their own territories. So we think that although this has been a terrible blow and, and actually lethality of COVID has been greater in rural areas, we think that uh, this rediscovering of the strength in rural communities is gonna give a lot of power to the movements and organizations which are, are come together through Via Campesina and, and other far, uh, small farm, peasant, and indigenous peoples movements. And we want to build solidarity with urban people, with people in cities, particularly in urban slums around the world, to try to build the kind of people's movements that can make these changes that everybody has been talking about today. And so with that, I'll stop and turn it over to our next speaker. Sorry that my slideshow didn't work. And thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity to speak here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm Rosa Castizo, and now I'm leading the Observatory for Sustainable Development and Climate Change for Latin America. Uh, we are working with 22 countries. Um, I, would, I would like to share some, some thoughts about that, and, and I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now. Okay, so I would like to speak about the, the power of connection. As you know, some of the tallest trees in the world have not so big roots, uh, and the secret to maintain their position during hundreds of years, like these sequoias, is that the roots are connected between them, making a strong network uh, and make them stronger. Do you imagine if our projects, uh, initiatives, institutions would be more connected in a permanent way, uh, that if they they have like different colors and we can really make this connection between all our initiatives beyond conference like that. Uh, this is the, the objective and the goal of uh, the observatory in my, in my normal life and my personal life. 
my goal is connect uh, people and institutions with nature. And in the case of the observatory that I'm leading, uh, we are connecting uh, institutions with uh, between them and with countries and, and with NGOs, um, uh, companies, and, and, and at the end, making a real hub for sustainable development and climate change uh, uh, within the 22 countries I mentioned. So um, every year we do um, a report for the Ibero-American summits. Two years ago was about sustainable development and climate change. And in this year, we are about to end uh, the one about innovation and sustainable development that all of you are completely invited to contribute. Two of the things that, um, that um, for us you know, is key they are key for 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 this uh, report and for the the current summit the summit is basically connect all the narratives that we have been speaking about uh, today in the conference like regenerative development that uh, edward mentioned the planetary boundaries the 2030 agenda that is uh, in every conference that we have been uh, uh, these this, uh, months. So all of us has this base on nature. And um, one of our goals is connect these narratives to make them stronger and to really make this, this influence to the, to the governments of, of the different states we are working with. Other important issue that I would like to mention and is so connected in this moment is the important role of, of, of the future of work. Although uh, the pandemic uh, and, 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 you know, every of us and we have been um, listening to friends that really they want to return to nature, not so many people are willing to really uh, work in regenerate nature and it's so so really um, now urgent uh, we really have to return to nature more and beyond uh, working just remotely in the middle of the countryside this is really the revolution that we have to, to take into account and is one of the key issues that observatory together with Regenera have that I will mention later is looking at. The future of regenerative, uh, the future of work really, really is regenerating nature. And this is a huge, um, a huge um, opportunity in terms of money, in terms of uh, people, and in terms of humanity, and in terms of the planet, obviously. With Regenera Hub, we also are partnering for working in these uh, issues. And now I would like to, to give the floor uh, to Juan Ramos, who is also working with, with us on that, and um, that is an expert on, on um, on these issues in, in Central America. So please, Juan, if you want to share your screen. So yeah, thank you, Rosa, for the invitation to be here. I'm really honored uh, to be around so many uh, individuals who are involved with agroecology. And today I want to speak a little bit about uh, Regenera. So this is a, this is a organization that is really looking to drive systemic change in Latin America and integrating technical expertise, working with communities, working with private enterprises. And at the end, what we want is a positive impact on the environment as well as on the local population. So as, uh, as we all know, climate change is drastically changing the world. And Latin America is having a big, big change. Rainfall is forecasted to fall by as much as 14% by 2050. And the five warmest years on record have all happened in the last five years. And extreme weathers, as we can see right now, are becoming the norm. So there's a lot of things that are packed into what this will tell, right? So migration is linked to the lack of climate resiliency in Latin America. You can already see it with the border wall that Trump is trying to keep people from migrating north. And this is just expected to continue and subsistence agriculture is really threatened by the droughts or the flooding that have already taken place. So agriculture, as we all know, plays a major problem uh, 
80% of the tropical deforestation is due to agriculture. 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from farming. And as much as 50% of Latin American land could become desertified by 2050. And as we all know how big agriculture is, is about 30% of the regional employment is directly or indirectly related to agriculture. So we can already see that big corporations are already starting to shift. You can see General Mills has made commitments on a million acres of land by 2030. One Business, which is a diverse group of multinational companies, have already pledged broad support for regenerative agriculture for investments. And you can already see that supply chain risks uh, are, are becoming a big thing. So it's becoming a big topic and it's something that big corporations are already seeing that it's gonna affect them internally in the next couple of years. And we are specifically working with regenerative agroforestry. So uh, we are specifically working with Syntropic Agriculture from Brazil. Um, and for the people that don't know, regenerative agroforestry basically combines agriculture with forestry. There's so many elements uh, that are positive that come out of this. Uh, carbon sequestration uh, is, is, really, is really, really high. And at the end, you have productive, profitable, and climate resilient, resilient use of land when compared to the traditional models that are used right now. So what we basically do is we diagnose uh, an area with a community. We co-design using native species, and then we implement, we implement and maintain these systems, and we're able to provide market access. And I feel that's a big part um, that people have talked about in the past. Um, Peter and Clara have been talking about reducing the distance between producers and consumers, and that's exactly what we look to do. So being able to offer the local population a diverse set of food that is free of fertilizers, free of herbicides, and the additional use can be brought on to an integrated supply chain that is able to sell these products at a differentiated price. And we originally started as Reagro Forestal, so it's a grassroots movement that started in 2016. Uh, in 2018, we organized the largest uh, regenerative agriculture event uh, in the Latin region, uh, bringing together a wide variety of experts working on agroforestry that had never known each other. So something Peter talked about is the need for organization, collaboration, partnerships, and that's something that we have really found that a lot of people are doing really interesting products. They're just not talking to each other. They're not collaborating as they should and they're not integrating themselves in terms of costs, in terms of being able to sell their products and create higher revenue. And uh, just last year, we started Regenera, which is a consulting enterprise to focus on implementing these projects. And Regenera Hub was registered in 2020, so that's the connection with Rosa and being able to provide more resources, more connections to the people we have in our community. And yeah, we see a huge amount of potential being able to work with NGOs, corporate corporations, and most of all, small and medium-sized agricultural communities. Uh, and basically what we see is a huge business model that's very innovative that you bring together a wide variety of actors and you're able to connect them with the right people, at the right time and at the end, our team is very multidisciplinary. We bring together a wide variety of people from different backgrounds, different countries that are all focused on agroecology and bring it, being able to regenerate our soil. And basically what we see is we see huge potential in being able to get the word out there of projects that are happening like ours, REDS, communities that are doing similar things in different countries. And what we're looking at the end is to have more partners, being able to integrate more people, be it funding, be it strategic partnerships. We're looking for a lot of research. Uh, in the past, we've actually worked with the University of Chapingo. So Peter, we brought in students to come and do internships to learn about the project we've been doing around the region. And yeah, the people that are interested in joining us, uh, they're my contact numbers and I'm more than happy to collaborate. Thank you very much.